Well, hey there, Mama, and welcome back to the Moms Overcoming Overwhelm podcast, episode 150. I'm Emily McDermott, and I'm here beside you on this journey as we work together to declutter your home, head, and heart. Imagine this scene. You're shopping at Target with one of your kids pulling on your leg and the other grabbing random items off the shelves, wailing, please, mommy, can I have this? (laughs) And an elderly woman who's in the same aisle smiles at you and says, oh, dear, you're going to miss these days. You know, the days are long, but the years are short. Has that ever happened to you? Or imagine that you buy a parenting book that your sister-in-law raves about that has to do with discipline. But when you try it out at home, it's just making you feel uneasy. But it's all that your friends are talking about. It's all that you're seeing in your Instagram ads. So you decide to just push through, even though it's making you miserable. So these are examples of unrealistic expectations and whether they're placed on us by well-meaning people or we place them on ourselves due to maybe what we've experienced in childhood. It's something that constantly plagues us with self-doubt as moms. We're asking, am I doing enough? Am I doing this right? And so I'm so excited to have Danielle Bettman back on the show. She is a parenting coach at Parenting Wholeheartedly and the host of the Failing Motherhood podcast. And we are talking about how to declutter unrealistic expectations and have confidence in our parenting again. So just a little bit about Danielle. She is a positive discipline certified parenting coach, and she empowers parents to crack the code of their strong willed child's personality, meeting their deepest core needs to improve their behavior and find new levels of patience which I desperately need. (laughs) An early childhood educator, certified teacher and home visitor, Danielle now equips parents from all over the world with Zoom. So instead of inadvertently inviting defiance by using traditional tools or playing whack-a-mole with short-sighted reactions, families get on the same page and learn how to cultivate cooperation while being kind and firm at the same time. So again, she's the host of the Failing Motherhood podcast, and she's passionate about eliminating shame from parents' vocabulary, reminding them they are the parents their kids need. And she is also a mom to two daughters, wife of 15 years to her high school sweetheart, and an avid fan of sunshine and coffee. So without further ado, grab that notebook and pen, and let's dive into today's conversation with Danielle Bettman. Hey there, mama. Are you tired of all the stuff crowding your home, calendar, and mind? Do you wish you could say goodbye to the endless to-do list running around in your head? Want to declutter but don't know where to start? You're in the right place. Welcome to Mom's Overcoming Overwhelm, where you will find proven and practical solutions to declutter your home, head, and heart. Hi, I'm Emily, a wife, boy mom, and simplicity seeker. I struggled to get pregnant and felt overwhelmed until I discovered decluttering could create the physical and emotional space I needed to become a mom. Now two kids later, I've transformed my life and motherhood by developing simple systems around decluttering, capsule wardrobes, kid stuff, cleaning and tidying, meal planning, time management, and more, and I can't wait to share them with you. If you're ready to reclaim the time and energy you crave, be present with your kids, and finally enjoy the life and motherhood you so deserve, let's kick overwhelm to the curb, shall we? Grab your lukewarm coffee, your notebook and pen, and clear off some counter space. Let's do this. Well, hey, Danielle, thank you so much for coming back on the Moms Overcoming Overwhelm podcast. I am really excited to talk to you today. Yes, thank you so much for having me back. I'm excited. Yeah, I was telling Danielle I had like this whole bank of interviews previously, and then I took the break for the summer, and I'm like, oh my gosh, (laughs) I need some great interviewees, and I know that you took a little bit of a break too for the summer. We were just talking about that. And I was looking through some of your recent podcast episodes and I just love, I mean, I'm going to have you introduce yourself again in a second, but failing motherhood, like you keep it real. And I love that about (laughs) you so, so much. And what we're talking about today is like the expectations that we place on ourselves, but also kind of what is placed on us by others and how we can kind of declutter that and break free of it. But before we jump in, can you please reintroduce yourself about you, your family, kind of who you serve, and then what you might like to do in your spare time? 
Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. So my name is Danielle. I am a parenting coach for families with strong-willed kids ages 2 to 10. And yes, I host the podcast Failing Motherhood. So if you're ever afraid that you're screwing up your kids, you are at home, join the club, <laughs> and uh, be reminded that you're not um, at, uh, over at our podcast. But the the way that I work with families is through a high-level, high-support group coaching program. Um, specifically for about four months where we work on improving your patience, changing the way you communicate and meeting your child's core needs of power and control. So you can eliminate negative behaviors in a way that is kind of framed if within positive discipline, which is emphasis on kind and firm. And uh, we work with both parents at the same time and it's all virtual. So it's families from all over and uh, it's, it's super, super vulnerable and honest as families kind of completely transform the culture of their home over just a few months and take a lot of ownership over their own behavior so they can feel much more proud of it. So um, I have, I'm, I absolutely love what I do. I'm so, so, so lucky to work with the families that I do because they have looked at their kid and their circumstances and they have said, let me learn what I need to learn to be the best parent for my kid. Um, and that takes so much strength and courage and I'm so proud of them. So that's what I do over at wholeheartedly parenting wholeheartedly. Um, and then I and myself, am a parent of two girls. They are, uh, 15 months apart. So right now they are 10 and 11 and they just entered fifth and sixth grade, which is crazy. Uh, we live in the middle of the Midwest in Nebraska. I've been married to my high school sweetheart now for 15 years. We've been together 21 or two. I can't remember at this point. Um, and I, in my spare time, I love to read fiction, specifically like mysteries or like thrillers um, where, you know, somebody died, but you have to figure out what happened the whole time. So that's, that's my guilty okay. pleasure. That's so fun. My husband and I have been watching different TV series. That's kind of how we unwind together. Yeah. And we're watching Only Murders in the Building right now. Love, love, love. <laughs> yes. So exactly. don't give anything away. We're on season <laughs> We're on season two. Don't give anything away. Oh, it just keeps um, getting better. Yeah, exactly. Such a good cast. So, yes. And Danielle is the real deal, people. <laughs> um, I attended her masterclass, which we can link to in the show notes, because mm -hmm. I have definitely have a strong-willed child um sitting in his bedroom right now <laughs> but um i will probably be a client of yours at some point like i'm just gonna put it out there like things are doing pretty that. well right now but you yeah. know i'm i'm um, happy to work with you in the future and highly recommend your services to all um and normally when we chat i ask my guests about like a time in their motherhood that they've felt overwhelmed but because i've already asked you that I thought we could put a little spin on it and any time that you can think of recent or otherwise when you felt like either you were putting unrealistic expectations on yourself or if you feel like somebody else either overtly or kind of on the sly was sort of um, putting an expectation on you and mm. kind of how you were able to deal with that because sometimes we have well-meaning relatives and comments and things yes. that make us kind of question um, mm -hmm. what we should be doing so i would be curious if there was any example from your own motherhood you would like to share oh so many yeah i mean i feel like just subconsciously or implicitly anytime you're parenting around your parents or in-laws you can just feel like a palpable energy of insecurity and it could be not at all warranted from even what they have said verbally or what they are actively judging or not judging. Uh, it just it just is there. It's like the elephant in the room. And uh, it's something that comes up with with clients a lot. So anytime I parent around my parents, um, I last year, my one of my daughters was on a Y basketball team and I had to wrestle with her not being good at it on a team sport where they do need people to like participate right at like a minimum level of engagement to score points and things and I could feel how uncomfortable that made me just watching knowing like it's completely fine this is the first time she's ever played this like it's a wide leg like, all the things but like I had to work on the pep talk in my head because I could just feel like I was letting other parents down or something like really way too 
much baggage in that moment. Um, and I also can never forget like one of the worst meltdown outbursts, emotional uh, sagas that happened at Walgreens. Or maybe it was CVS. I think it was CVS. Um, where I had the auto body experience of just like almost floating above us and then seeing us from all angles of all the strangers in the store and just feeling like I, all right, this is one of those moments. It's going to go down in our parenting history of like the meltdown at CVS. How am I going to handle it? And I actually had enough awareness that it was like, I was on the spot and I, you know, managed it really well, but I, it easily could have gone the other way if I let that insecurity take over. Um, but I feel like that it just kind of com- continues to come up. I don't think you ever master managing expectations. No. And the examples that you gave, so my husband and I were both like band geeks growing up. <laughs> I did dance and band, and then it was like no sports. And so our boys are getting into sports and it's interesting because they actually are taking to it pretty well and they're enjoying it. But I understand what you're saying as far as like, cause I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, you did competitive cheer. Is that right? And okay. gymnastics. And gymnastics. Yeah. Okay. I was trying to remember from our previous conversation. So like Good when, <laughs> yeah. So when you have kind of this background of like you were involved in a sport or like something in a team, yeah. you know, and then it's so hard to like figure out that balance with like, is this an expectation? Like it's good for my kids to be able to be on a team and kind of have those, you know, values, or yeah. is it that it's like my expectation and what I think uh, others are thinking mm-hmm. of me or like my kid. And um, the other thing is that I definitely had a target. It was a target meltdown. Okay. <laughs> and it was the one time I have, I think Sean was three, but carrying him, he was big enough that like I had to do like kind of like the wedding carry over the threshold you know yep. he was that big oh boy but carrying him from the toy <laughs> section which is usually in the back of the store always in the back all yep. the, yeah always in the back <laughs> all the way through and just like i just need to get out of this store i just need to get yeah. out of this store. and uh. then being able to again like you said have the wherewithal to not be like why are that was so embarrassing like why are you embarrassing me in front of all these people like it's not about me like my kid is dysregulated he's upset he's hurting whatever but sometimes my first inclination is like oh my gosh like what are others thinking of me carrying this screaming child through the store so besides like maybe our own childhood or like our perceptions of like what others are thinking like what are where do you think some of these like expectations are coming from or kind of like placed on us because i know you know a lot about um child psychology and like parent psychology and i'm just curious from your personal and professional background like where do these expectations come from yeah I feel like I am incredibly lucky because with the work I do, I am exposed to a consistent influx of reality checks and vulnerability from other parents and conversations about these topics that continue to remind me of all the things we need to hear a hundred million thousand times (laughs) in in the healthiest sense. And that it's it's very much like uh, the best benefits of a support group and why people keep going back to things like AA or, or Al-Anon because they're just redirections that you constantly need to fight from what feels like the very natural flow of instincts and expectations and patterns and of behavior that our society constructs without us really even realizing it. And it, w- when you said that, it made me think about The way that I heard my parents or my mom talk about other families at the dinner table, in the car, you know, to to my dad without us even like being a part of the conversation and how much I think that shaped how I expected to be judged just because I saw other people being judged. And it wasn't anything that I was doing that warranted anything. It was just like a, an overwhelming sense of this is how everyone thinks. So 
then if that, if they think that of that person, then they're going to find plenty of things to judge about me. Um, you know, and here's what I'm already aware of that I'm insecure about. So that's just going to put a magnifying glass or exacerbate or feel like I'm, you know, in the Truman show and everybody's watching. So, and I, and, you know, I think that there's much worse varying degrees of that. And there could be, you know, people that have much less of that and naturally, but I think that it's inevitable. I think that it's a huge part of trying to find your own path in your own way with any level of confidence as a, a parent, let alone, you know, self-discovery as a whole and self-improvement as, a, as an adult. But I think uh, so much of it comes back to uh, not or knowing who knows your kid best which is you, not your in-laws, not your parents. Um, of course, they're well-meaning, but it's a different world and the, it's a different kid. So parenting is, needs to be much more nuanced and individualized to the kid that's in front of you rather than any huge overarching best practice principles that were true of raising kids 25 years ago. That everything needs to be gut checked by, based on the context and the environment and the kid and their temperament and personality and all those things. So, in order to really find what works best for you, is to feel convicted in your own gut. So, like, usually I tell parents if it feels wrong, it probably is, which could be you trying to do something that you heard as a great best practice on Instagram, but it doesn't feel right for some reason, that's usually probably true. And so that might look like trying to put in, you know, a, a, a strict discipline practice, like, I don't know, one, two, three magic. And then just feeling like it feels icky when you try to do it, even though you're doing it by the book. Okay. Listen to that. Figure out maybe why that is and validate yourself because you do know your kid better than the author of that book knows your kid. Um, but it's very hard to continue to kind of find and wrestle with and uh, settle on what feels right to you as a parent in your family without really being able to kind of be exposed to a lot of things to be able to put it into context, if that makes sense. Oh, definitely. I, I think a lot about like my grandmother's generation and then us, you know, <laughs> I think about that she raised four kids and she was in a rural area and like, where did her influences come from? Probably oh, yeah. her parents and her, she lived with her in-laws, I believe in the same house. Of course, I'm sure they had some opinions, Oh yeah, um, you know, their church family, like that kind yeah. of thing. But then you don't have necessarily all the exposure that we do. And here mm -hmm. we are on a on a podcast giving, you know, tips and guidance and advice, but like, you know, podcasts and the books and the social media and everything, just kind of like the exposure and the influences from everyone coming at you all the time. I feel like there's so much more questioning mm -hmm. and not that that's necessarily a bad thing to like figure out and, and learn about other perspectives but i feel like we're constantly as parents doubting ourselves 100%. like everything is i'm doubting if this is the quote unquote right decision mm -hmm. and also thinking or catastrophizing about what the ripple effect might be so yeah, going back to your daughter and like mm -hmm. you know okay well if she does i'm not saying this is you but like if she doesn't play basketball at the y then she won't mm -hmm. play basketball in this league and then she won't play basketball in college and blah, 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 you know yeah and i have to stop myself anytime i kind of have that thinking because especially where i am in washington dc everyone is like so focused on all the clubs and the achievements and all of these mm -hmm. things i have to be like no like what what are my husband and i on the same page about with our values like our family mission and our values and yeah. what feels right um but it's really hard <laughs> it's so hard i think any in you know too much of a good thing is a bad thing and so it's like everything in moderation. I think we've swung from, you know, what you said of your grandma's generation to now where we have too much exposure, too much stimulus, too much information. And it's absolutely at an overload where we can't possibly make a decision without second guessing or overthinking or undermining our own selves. <laughs> and, and, and I think it, there's always a lot of parallels for me between entrepreneurship and parenting, 
where, yeah, if you go to start a business and then start to get an algorithm full of advice about business, you're instantly going to get imposter syndrome. You're going to feel like you don't know anything about anything because you don't. <laughs> but then, you know, you're not going to feel any more sense of confidence the more voices are speaking into what you should be doing or what you're missing or what you need. And, you know, that's where the best decision I made was to find one coach, unfollow the rest of the noise and spend a, in total a year and a half working with her so that I could ask all of my questions specifically, knowing that it was coming from, you know, a, a source I trusted. That's what I feel like absolutely laid the foundation I needed for my business. I don't think I could have created that same sense of like solidity in my, that's not a word, in my uh, model of my business without that, you know, level of support. And so that that's why I recommend uh, my, the way that I designed my, my programs, because you, you know, going deep with one source, I think provides a sense of clarity that you just can't get from like the hodgepodge quilts of input otherwise. Yeah. Really like being able to put the blinders on and then yeah. being able to focus. Um, so the episode that you had, which I'll link in the show notes, which really encouraged me to bring you on to the show was something that has happened to me before and i'm sure depending on people's stage of motherhood it seems to be like when we're in the thick of the chaos and have like the young kids that are screaming and pulling on our legs and everything mm -hmm. so if we go back to like the target for example and this very sweet older woman you know comes up to you danielle and she's like oh you know sweetie the the days are long but the years are short no. Yeah. Is that it? I almost missed it up. You're going to, you're really going to miss <laughs> this. Like they're only little for so long. And then we go on Instagram and it's like, I'm, you know, sleeping beside my child and smelling his hair and like all the like super romanticized things. And then yeah. for me as someone that had postpartum anxiety, I just figured out these like PMDD type symptoms that were causing me to like cry, 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 cry. You know, luckily mm -hmm. I've been able to figure that out. I'm feeling like a mm -hmm. new person. So we're happy Good. about that. But just to like, wait, that th this is not, no, I'm not enjoying this. Or like my kids go back to school and I am overjoyed because yeah. they have been at each other the whole summer. And yeah, we've had some good memories, but mm -hmm. most of it has been them at each other's throats. For the whole yeah. summer. So <laughs> how do we deal with kind of that, that like guilt of like the expectation is that I'm supposed to be enjoying this all the time because yeah. this is what the well-meaning woman in Target and my Instagram feed is telling me that every moment in motherhood is precious and I'm supposed to be enjoying it all. Like, and so yeah. if I don't enjoy it all, does that make me a bad, bad mom? Yeah. Yeah. So can you talk a little <laughs> bit about that? Because I know we've all yes. felt like that time to time. Oh my gosh, I have so much to say about this because <laughs> I, I do think that we all struggle with it because there is an element of truth to it and we know it. Because I, I had my daughters back to back and when I was in the hospital with my second daughter, I was crying out of the inevitable nostalgia in the future of looking back at this moment, knowing how quick it's going to go because of how quick the last year had been and how different things had felt already just having a 15 month old. And I will never remember what that felt like because it feels like, you know, you get to stop time for a second and just realize like the perception of it. And it's so impactful because you know how fleeting the moments are, you know, how precious they are, you know, how much you want to stop time and soak it up and, you know, be present and all those things. And the idea of it sounds absolutely idyllic because it is unrealistic and we don't get to stop time. And there's never going to be moments where we get to not have any adult responsibilities, not be a person outside of who we are in motherhood and not have external stress and anxiety and other things happening in real time at the same time as raising them. And we wish that was the case that we could just, you know, detach and, and stop time, but they, you can't. So trying to deal with that inevitable reality is a hard pill to swallow. And it isn't made any better by all the voices saying, you know, well, the, the mess can wait 
because, you know, babies don't keep and all that messaging. It's uh, so, I think, toxic because it just pushes the bruise that's already there that makes us feel even worse that we know we failed at being present today. We know we didn't get to soak them up at bedtime. In fact, we yelled at them at bedtime. So yeah, make me feel even worse about that, please. Um, I think that when when I was reflecting on this for my episode, I really just think that there is a, a fascination with early childhood years that is absorbing like the the cuteness and how adorable they are and how much you just like, you know, one day you're going to set them down and never pick them up again. And it's, you know, it's going to break your heart into a thousand pieces. But I, I do think that that pressure is um, manufactured in some ways because uh, as, as parents and, and as a society, we're a little bit intimidated by their independence. And when they talk back, when they have hormones, when they go off on their own and make decisions we, we don't love or they don't become who we thought they were going to be or, you know, they they inevitably have their own struggles in life and hard times. Um, it's not as cute and adorable, frankly. And so, of course, we find that, you know, we're, we're so nostalgic and sentimental and, you know, just wish we could go back to the early years. And and I nostalgia. It, it comes back to being able to be, be back in that moment without any of the external stress and anxiety. That's what it actually is, which is fake. <laughs> That's not how it felt in the moment. Believe, you know, you, you weren't that fun, having, having that much fun, frankly, <laughs> you're ranking, trying to get a baby desperately to sleep. Um, you don't really actually want to go back to that moment. Right. It's the idea of it without the anxiety, without the stress, without all of the other things happening at that same time. And so uh, what I wanted to reassure my listeners was um, there's so much more good to come. And, you know, the, they there are pros and cons to every age uh, as they get older. Yes, they become more independent, more themselves. Uh, they have BO. <laughs> there are other issues, <laughs> but I mean, parenting is a lifelong endeavor. This is a, your parent-child relationship lasts for life. So oh, everything should come into a much more widened, zoomed out lens of the, you know, what I do is not only influential and impactful for just a few years when they're really easily manipulated and I can pick them up and take them out of the store. Now, everything should be in the perspective of how will this impact the adult they become? How will this impact our relationship in 20 years? Will they want to come home for Christmas? Will I get to spend time with them regularly? Will they want to hang out with me? And how will, how does that impact how, you know, we interact now? And there's so much potential for so many more fun memories, great times, amazing opportunities to get to know the person that they become when you look at it in that long-term lens. And I think that can take a lot of that pressure off of like, well, you only get 18 summers with them. No, you don't. And if you get more than that, it is an absolute privilege because that's not afforded to every family. And I think being able to just be grateful for the moment you're in is um, is a really powerful thing. No, I, I totally agree. And that's the thing. I've never been super sentimental with like that. Oh, only 18 summers. And I have a good friend and her, she has um, one child. It was her, their miracle baby. And he just went off to college and she's been preparing herself like a long time for it. Mm -hmm. And she can still appreciate like what's happening in the moment without having to be like, again, romanticizing everything mm -hmm. for the past. And I think it's our normal inclination to do that. Sometimes I think with my husband, I'm like, what did we do on our weekends before we had Oh my kids? gosh, right? <laughs> <laughs> like we literally can't remember. I'm like, I think we watched like entire football games, like the full three hours. I think we did that. <laughs> There's a thing called binge watching that people do. I don't know. <laughs> but I think it's so great to, you know, kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning, really to have that gut check and like, does this feel right? Does it feel good for me and our family in this situation? And mm -hmm. also to recognize that there are blessings in the past, obviously, but there's so many blessings in the future, like to look forward to and to have that perspective, I think is so healthy. Um, anything else you want to share before you can also share where people can best connect with you? Yeah. Um, I always want to, you know, with this whole idea, I think the main takeaway is 
it's okay to step away. It's okay to not maximize every moment, not do a Pinterest project every day after school, not hold yourself to an unreasonable standard and, uh, and really advocate for your own needs. Because if you do lay yourself down as a doormat for 18 years out of this idea of like, you know, I only have so much time and it's so precious and I have to spend every waking moment staring at my child. <laughs> um, that does not do them a, a service. It does them a disservice. It Whatever is not benefiting and serving you as their parent, it is not benefiting them. And sometimes that's going to mean hard decisions like we can't do the competitive travel league as a family, right? Where, yeah, that's that's a very hard decision. There's a lot there. There's a lot of potential memories and, you know, things in that, that past that could be a ben benefit. But if that's going to eventually drain your finances to a very stressful point or put a grate on your marriage relationship that five years from now ends up combusting out of burnout, that's probably not the best decision for your family. And it's really hard to know that in the moment, but zooming out to say in that big wide lens of what are we, what, what's the trajectory 20 years from now and let those goals in, inform today what this season should look like for our family, it's going to be saying no a little bit more often and having to do that out of a source of self-advocacy, but just know it is more damaging to your kids to see you burnt out all the time, overwhelmed, taking it out on them and making them feel a little bit responsible or guilty for their interests or their passions rather than being able to be a sturdy leader that is able to allocate balance and say, we this is what we can manage in the season. These are our limitations. How can we find an outlet for you within those frameworks so that we all stay sane and, and prioritize our relationships? Um, and I think that that's just hard to implement overall, but you know, you need to hear as many quote unquote expert voices as you can giving you that permission so that you actually do feel like you can do that. <laughs> yeah. I always feel like I'm giving decluttering permission slips. So yes. I have the decluttering <laughs> ones and Danielle has the parenting ones. And yep. like I say, I'm I giving them out very copiously. Yes. Yeah. I was saying, I give them out like Oprah gives, gives out cars. So there you go. So please tell us the best way that people can connect with you, where they can find you, all the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So wherever you're listening to this podcast, you can search Failing Motherhood, subscribe, follow, find us there. Um, we have 160 episodes. I think we started at a very similar time as um, as Emily. So uh, lots, lots and lots of interviews and advice for parenting uh, kind of neurodivergent or very strong-willed kids. And you'll find your home there if that's you. Um, my website, parentingwholeheartedly.com. That's where you can find that free masterclass on being a calm and confident parent of your strong-willed child, um, releasing guilt and being able to not crush their spirit, but find ways that are kind and firm to prioritize your relationship. And then uh, I also have uh, the more info on how to work with me there at parentingwholeheartedly.com and on Instagram, I'm at parent underscore wholeheartedly. Wonderful. I will link to everything. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's always wonderful chatting with you. And I just really appreciate your time. Of course. Thanks for having me. This is so much fun. If you like today's podcast, here's what you can do. Just take 30 seconds to leave me a review. I know you're a busy mama. You're overwhelmed, in fact. But 30 seconds of your day makes such an impact. I'll be blessed by your words. They'll definitely make my day. And who knows, you might be entered for this month's giveaway. An Apple podcast, scroll down to write a review. Thanks so much for your time. I'm so grateful for you.